So, ads, you love them, right? Well, what if they went away? Today, we'll explore the question, is advertising obsolete? What if chatbot search and blockchain gave power back to the consumer? I'm Steven Rosenbaum. And I'm Gene DeRose. This is Future Forward. And let us launch. So we got a special guest uh, with us today, our first special guest. We're hoping to do a lot more of this in the future. His name is Ramsey Woodcock. He's a professor of law at University of Kentucky. All right, he's coming up midway through the show. And also excited to welcome our friends at IEEE Spectrum Magazine to Future Forward. IEEE Spectrum is the flagship magazine and the website of IEEE the world's largest professional organization devoted to engineering and applied sciences. And we are excited to work with them on edit and they're gonna help the pod and they're gonna help you spread the word. It's excellent to have them. Welcome IEEE. Uh, let me introduce uh, Ramsey Woodcock. Ramsey is a, uh, a, a lawyer and a law professor and uh, a very, very bright guy. So Ramsey, welcome to Future Forward. Let me, let me just start with an easy question. When you talk about advertising being obsolete and antitrust, is that meant to be provocative or do you actually imagine it happening? I do imagine it happening. I, I, I mean, you know, sort of growing up in the United States, it can be hard to imagine a world without advertising. But um, up until very recently and certainly still to this day in many countries, you don't have any commercial advertising at all. I mean, I remember when I first went to I, I first went to China in the 90s. You had very, very little advertising. Now, that's not exactly uh, a way to sell no advertising by referring to an authoritarian um, dictatorship. But the um, but the point is, uh, uh, no, I mean, a world without advertising is not um, something that's sort of beyond the realm of imagination. It's something that exists in, 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 in a lot of places. So I don't mean to be sort of... Uh, science fiction like in in this proposal and and actually as i was researching um uh, an article that i've written on on the issue i discovered that you know going if we go back only 40 or 50 years you know the vast majority of uh intellectuals and economists and so on in the united states were very opposed to advertising and it's only really in the last generation and a half or so that a kind of national consensus seemed to arise that um that advertising was good for society so, right. so maybe roll back and 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 tell us the thesis. I mean, what 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 was the premise of the article? So, uh, so so you'd be probably surprised to discover that the um, the reason for which economists tend to think that advertising is good for society, or have argued that it is over the last few uh, decades, is the idea that it provides useful product information. And you know, when you hear that. You immediately you're like, what planet do these economists live on? Because we know that advertising is about a lot more than simply providing consumers with product information that they may not have had. But that's the only justification that economists have found for why it's good for the economy. Uh, and so as soon as you, you look at that and you then step back and realize that we're living in the information age, you put these two things together and you realize, wait a second, we live in an age in which we have free access to product information of almost any kind we could ever want. So what does advertising actually add to that? If I can go online and get 5,000 reviews offered up by actual users of a product for free on any number of review websites, why do I need to have advertising thrust upon me through Google AdWords and so on in order to provide me access with product information? If I want it, I can have it. So the economic justification for advertising which is solely that it provides us with useful product information has effectively been eliminated by the rise of the information age in the internet. And yet advertising has persisted. Why? Well, it's not just some gross mistake. It's because advertising also has a manipulative or what the economists call a persuasive function. And that's what's doing all the work. But economists agree that advertising in its purely persuasive form is not socially beneficial. It doesn't contribute anything to GDP. It just changes consumer preferences. In fact, gives consumers less control over the products that they that they consume, and and, and therefore represents a net loss to society. Yeah. So, uh, so I mean, yeah, Gene, you you have, you, have, you have a bunch of friends in this space. Like, I, you know, are you inviting Ramsey over to a cocktail party to? have your, your oh my god 100 <laughs> percent. he's at that dinner party with you know jesus christ and freud um, <laughs> but 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 seriously 
I do think I like the way you presented it and framed it in and it's the heart of the matter, which is persuasion, even at a time going way back when converting people to sales is the reason why people did it. Certainly going back 100 years or more in other forms of media, just informing them of what you did and where it was and how you could buy it and what the product was information. Um, I do find myself, and this is not so much a devil's advocate to you as much as sort of like trying to unpeel the onion layers, which is, you know, in a world where so many products are commoditized and there are no differences kind of in the inherent element of what some of them are, informing on a deeper and a broader level, I guess the question is, it, would it still be in the hands of somebody selling something to do the informing or what a new version of, of sharing what a product's attributes were, or somebody does customer service differently or offers this, like, that's a very pedestrian way to dive in here, but I do find um, in a world where media exists, um, what would they be doing? Stepping away completely from communicating? The advertising. They wouldn't. It, it, so, so obviously, firms need to be able to get information about their products out. And you know, it's, the only reason why that information is available freely on the internet is because firms have been producing it. So, I, you know, so, so obviously, firms should have a right to provide the sort of, you know, basic amount of information about products that's necessary to make it possible for people to call that information up when they want it by doing searches. So, you put product information on your own website, you give it to Amazon if they're selling your product so that they can put it in the product specs section. All of that is legitimate because that's information. Right. But that's really a very small part of what advertising does, right? And so right. beyond that, advertising moves from being purely informative and sort of uh, uh, economy expanding and becomes uh, the anti-competitive threat that, um, yeah. that, that identified so, it to be. So when you yeah. put this out there, did, like, did anyone at the FTC reach out to you and say, Professor Woodcock, that's interesting. We'd like to hear more about that. No, that's a no. <laughs> but, I, but I am interested in what the response has been, because, you know, in the article post, there's there's a couple hundred comments. And even though I know you published that off of your research six or so months ago plus. But, you know, what is the general response then? Or has this been something that you've been talking about uh, kind of for a while? This is not something I've been talking about for a while. So I, I was uh, at an academic conference about a year ago. I'm mainly an antitrust scholar. Antitrust, right? Sherman, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so I haven't, I haven't, you know, hadn't thought a ton about advertising at all or really the media connection. But I was at a conference that was devoted to sort of uh, the future of uh, media economics, and that's when I encountered these arguments that sort of the, the economic justification for adver advertising is the provision of product information, and I just put the two together. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, interestingly enough, it, you know, so I, I, I wrote an article up and I, um, I submitted it to, to law journals and the Yale Law Journal, which is, you know, probably the number one ranked uh, law journal in the country, oddly enough, uh, took an interest in it uh, and, 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 and published it. But beyond that, I've gotten really nothing but hostility uh, with respect to the idea. It was actually incredibly difficult for me just to get that op-ed um, published, the one that you read. It took yeah. a lot of negotiating with the, the wow. outfit that publishes it. Uh, and, um, you know, I've, I've circulated the article quite a bit, but I think um, I think the notion in this day and age, after there's been this sort of cultural acceptance of advertising, which I think really is, has, has been almost complete since the 90s, right. the notion that you would, that there'd be a reason to get rid of it is sort of anathema to just about everybody. Right. By right. the way, just just to be clear, when you say it was difficult to publish, the Fast Company reprint wasn't difficult. It was the original. No, it was the original, just getting it out there to begin with. But I actually, I mean, I had, you know, New York Magazine initially was interested in it, and then they, um, you know, they cut it at the last moment. Uh, so oh, there was, interesting. Yeah. So there, you know, you, you could you could sort of tell that <laughs> this was an idea. Um, well, for publishers to publish your article is the definition of biting the hand that feeds you, isn't it? I mean, right. right? right. I mean, and, right. and 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 part of, frankly, what I'm enjoying about having you on the pod is that I think this idea is inherently, you know, the idea that advertising as it currently exists is a good thing. You know, objectively, not a lot of people would sign off on that. 
right? I mean, and if you look at Netflix as an example, right, you can see behaviors where television used to in, in, totally be controlled by advertising, and now people pay 7 or $11 a month to Netflix, and one of the things you buy is quality programs, and one of the other things you buy is no ads, right? right. So that, yeah. you know, that we're, that the idea that something existed doesn't mean that it isn't going to change, and I think you're kind of on the cutting edge of that. Yeah. Well, it reminds me a little of um, kind of like healthcare debates, which is that, you know, it would be great if we had universal health care. But how do you practically kind of, you know, rejigger everything with all the powers that be in place? And I like the fact that you're not just talking about some intellectually radical concept. You, you believe it's something um, that's possible. Uh, I, I do feel like the sort of what would the steps be, what might it look like in the future, which is less intellectually interesting, is also really interesting uh, and would get a little bit more of an ear. Do you, do you are you familiar with things like like media literacy and the history of sort of getting people to understand when they're being advertised or marketed to? Or is that just kind of too much in the middle of just. Yes. No, that, that's something I'm not very familiar with at all. Yeah, and well, and it's funny, the history, the brief history of it is that when there were smaller number of networks and lots of controls and fear of monopoly in this country, um, you, they didn't call it media literacy, but there were certain amount of um, uh, uh, modalities that had to be uh, represented in a right way, you know, with, with ads and things like that. The kind of stuff we're most familiar with that is the footnotes of, um, of political ads or that you see in pharma ads is something that in... Europe and in democratic socialist kind of countries, it almost goes to a curriculum level of informing kids and making it a part of, you know, but that's a very soft kind of thing, right? It's about, you know, how to understand when you're being emotionally manipulated versus it shouldn't be allowed. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I share that um, view that it's sort of, it's, there's something soft about it, right? And, and so the, the, found, the fundamental part of my um, position on this is that we shouldn't be distinguishing between, you know, what is called in the law false and misleading advertising and what, what, we, what we would call non-false, non-misleading, but persuasive advertising, yeah. right? Both, in, both involve a certain amount of manipulation. Right? So, the argument, so the argument here is any ad simply through repetition can, ha can change your preferences. Right. right, can make something more familiar than something else, such that you know when you go to the supermarket aisle, you're more likely to pick it than you are to pick other things. Not because you have any rational basis for choosing it, other than the fact that you've simply seen it more. Right. right. You could have an, you could have repetitive advertising, which is non-misleading in the legal sense. It's not uh, it's not a misstatement of fact, so it's not uh, false advertising, and yet it has a manipulative effect on us. Well, the very notion of branding as a label that is really about attributes and emotional and you know contextual right. softness right has nothing to do with it's everything but <laughs> the, right. the you know and the the, blocking and tackling and the interesting thing about this is that economists have for a hundred years recognized that this this persuasive acts aspect exists and is not good for the economy because the, the a market economy runs on the idea that consumers are sovereign that they're imposing their preferences on the market so if they make when they make purchase decisions, those purchase decisions accurately represent their preferences and firms therefore have to follow them through price signals. Otherwise, they'll go out of business. But so right. when the firm can can change those preferences, then the firms are dictating to the market instead of the market dictating production signals to the firms. And that reduces the ability of the economy to actually respond to our preferences and to provide us with the maximum uh, 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 that 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 we should be able to get, and so, so there shouldn't be this distinction between false and misleading advertising and purely persuasive, but we've never been able to attack it because we always knew that combined with our persuasive advertising, there was also useful product information, and we did need consumers to be informed. Right. The brilliant thing I think about today is that we no longer have to have that anxiety that the persuasive advertising also contains a kernel of useful product information that makes it essential for the economy to function. And so we can finally get at it in the same way that we used to get at false and that we still today get at false and misleading advertising. So, so, so we, have, we have just like two minutes left. I have to ask, has anyone reached out to you 
positively? Has anyone said, hey, let's learn more about this? Or has it literally just been, because some of the comments on the article were essentially like, go away, you're bothering us. So interestingly enough, the, the people who have reached out to me and have shown the greatest interest are people in the advertising industry. Right. So I've gotten, you know, people running advertising companies reach out to me. I've got, uh, I've got advertising lawyers reach out to me. I've got people who are in the industry who, interestingly enough, seem to find it um, most relevant. It's, it's people in the economics profession, people in the broader legal profession, the antitrust regulators who, you know, who think that this is sort of a wingnut argument. But, but interestingly not enough, not the industry itself. So, wow. so, so we've, we're going to be doing a panel together uh, at South by Southwest. Uh, like it, ha, have you prepared some examples or some, descri- you know, I mean, obviously you started the article talking about the Russian meddling in Facebook, which is a red hot topic now. I mean, it seems like your idea becomes more relevant as people understand that advertising is being used to manipulate voters, to manipulate ideas, to to fake controversies within the democracy. It seems like, you know, if it really is going to be run amok and unfixable, then maybe we should start to think about a way to diminish it. Yeah, I think I think that's right. I mean, the, you know, the, the the thing, the night, the interesting thing about the Russia hacking investigation is it has made people aware of the fundamentally manipulative character of advertising in a way that, for a generation or so, you know, that seemed to sink away when everybody was taking, you know, delight in Super Bowl commercials and so on, and starting to view advertising as an art form into itself. Now we're starting to remember that there is a dark side to it. But the question is, and I think it's very much an open question, is whether that recognition is going to actually jump the line from recognizing it in the political advertising sphere to recognizing that all of commercial advertising is essentially aimed at the same thing. Well, yeah, and I would just, just yeah. as a final point to throw in there, and, and media and even journalism itself becomes kind of um, complicit in this or the overlaps become hard to manage, right? Because a lot of what gets presented, especially in these digital interactive modes, are uh, little pieces of persuasion, I guess, or information, and you don't know the sources, you don't know the authority, relatively speaking, you don't know whether it's InfoWars or the New York Times or a Facebook news feed, you know, this is the same kind of thing. So I do feel like um, fact checking and... Well, there's, 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 there's something absurd about the fact that you know, journalism and newspapers, which are dedicated to producing an informed, unmanipulated public, Objective, yeah. would be getting their revenue for generations now from giving corporations space to manipulate the public. I mean, there's something odd about the fact that you'd have these two functions subsisting on the exact same newspaper page. It's a form of original sin. <laughs> It really Ramsey, is. thank you so much. We will see you in Austin in two weeks and look forward to a frothy, fun, and hopefully controversial conversation. And, uh, Good luck and, with it. I love the article and, and the research, too. Thanks. All right. We'll talk soon. Great to be here. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. So, so, Gene, you know, I was hoping that he would be fabulous, but he was even more like, he's not joking. Like, he's serious no. as a heart attack. He wants ads yeah. to go away. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and it's not just a philosophical kind of revolution rant he believes it's something that could be done the toothpaste can be put back in the tube i think we should set up a patreon account for him (laughs) that's interesting Um, look uh, i it's very hard with somebody like that who's so brilliant and is so conceptual but even though he's realistic about it the tendency in my banal simple mind is to get into the sort of nuts and bolts of what it would actually look like to you know to 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 repeal the you know re re put the layers back on the onion to to get it done and i do think and also to challenge some of the issues that one of the things i would have liked to have asked is you know so does checking reviews on amazon count you know, or is that too inclined to be subjective? All right. So, so uh, a plug for for our uh, our Austin South by Southwest uh, panel. It is going to be four guests. Baratunde Thurston will be the moderator. He's terrific. He describes himself now as a pro democracy activist. Tracy Lee is the product design director at the New York Times, talking about 
how ads fit into their future. I'll be there uh, talking about social impact media and Ramsey Woodcock, who we just heard from, will be there as well. It promises to be um, quite controversial and I think will sell out. So it's, uh, it's uh, March 8th, uh, which is a Friday uh, and it's 11 a.m. And if you, uh, if you are in Austin and planning to come to South by Southwest, we would love to see you there. And yeah, and you know what we should also do is uh, it, right before or on our website or something, we should uh, give a link for those that might want to live stream or catch it uh, afterwards, since I assume that kind of thing is done in these modern times. You know, I do not know the answer, but we will find out. <laughs> yeah, Meanwhile, assuming. we're going to leap forward. We will be back again next week for another episode of Future Forward. And our friends at IEEE will be with us next week as well. And some of their stories will be part of the pod. So until then, party on. Party on.